uh, student movement. I know it's very sad, but I was also very pleased to see that actions are taken. I think we should be actually very happy that people, their heart, the fire of social justice is not dead, is taken on by individuals. That's precisely the kind of things I think we'd like to talk about. But this, uh, I need to be taller. Oh, it's feel much better now. Okay. <laughs> now I can talk. Just now that was just murmuring, thank you. And now, when I was playing with this Google thing, uh, you know this Google Earth thing, right? Is uh, uh, when Jan was saying I was born in China, Sichuan province. So I want to re recount the story a little bit. Uh, that, 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 that something. I was born in a in a little village. Like this is not really my village. It's like a village. My pretend to be my village. Okay, I couldn't find that my vi my village is not important to be on there. Uh, anywhere, okay. So you can find my village, okay. But it's like my village in the, in the Sichuan province. And uh, but I can tell you, uh, m my house was very much like this. Okay, this was uh, like this is uh, look almost exactly like my house. Really, it is. Uh, so I, I was born there, and um, and I was born to be a peasant, to be a farmer. And this was in the 1960s. You know, in China, there was very tough time. People were dying. I saw people starving in my village. But funny thing, I never felt poor. It's really interesting. It's, I never felt poor. For about uh, two or three months, we may not have food. But somehow, my father always managed to get some. You know, I, mean, I don't know, legal or illegal, but he got some. You know? and so I never felt poor. But, but also, at the same time, what's important is that um, uh, I was very bad at uh, farming. So, uh, so I, I went to school. You know? So all of this, I'm a failed peasant. That's, that's how it works. <laughs> And if I had stayed in a, in a village, I would be, become the worst farmer in China. It's, uh, it's, uh, they are, uh, but the thing is that when I went to school, that's why things began to change when the teachers, I don't know, I don't remember anything they taught me. They just made me feel good. And then I was able to, because I was so small, and uh, in China, in the village, you have uh, I had three sisters, just me as a single guy. You know, that's not a very good asset. So I was bullied all the time. Uh, until I went to school, I began to outsource my personal protection to the big guys. I did their homework and let them copy my test, and then they did my fighting for me. <laughs> and so schools did a lot of things to me, made me feel good, and uh, you know, also helped me find an alternative out of my village. That's something I want to really chat with you today about is but what does education do? When we talk about the real challenges of education, what does education mean? For me, I was really fortunate and lucky to have a school just as another space for me, just make me feel good, make me feel good. That's very important. I think a place makes me feel good, a place, an alternative space than my village. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. Another thing I was also thinking about is uh, what does poverty mean? I think in, sometimes if you observe from outside, you may think poverty is extremely disabling. It can be. I don't want to glorify poverty, but also can be a major motivator for people. You want to escape. The desire to escape poverty can be tremendous. However, if you convince people that they cannot escape poverty, that, that condescending attitude may be a problem. So that's why today I think when I look at education sometimes, um, I've been talking about this. Say, if you cannot help, at least do not hurt. So I think educators and schools and education leaders should adopt that. We should do the same kind of oath as doctors. We start by saying, do no harm in schools. We do a lot of harm to poor children because we have this uh, very uh, kind of middle class belief that you have to know certain things, so we want to fix your deficit. When children come to our school, we tell them you cannot read, you cannot write, henceforth you are useless, let me help you to read. And by doing so, we may have just disabled the drive, the ability to change. So that's my brain about the beginning part. My whole presentation is written around that issue about how do we preserve the human motivation to change, human motivation to be better, not trying to disable them in education. So I hope we would adopt this idea called uh, do no harm. The first clause in education is do no harm, okay? If you can't help, do not hurt, because sometimes in the name of giving children a good education, we've just hurt.
hurt them. And what we hurt most is mindset, is confidence, is the future. So let's think about that. Now I'm going to move on to a much bigger problem. This is, a, do you know what this is? You, have you seen this thing? It, it's a Google car, okay. So it's a Google car, it's, it's, it's one of them, it's ungoogleable, okay, this is a, but this is Googleable, okay. It's a Google car, what is a Google car? A Google car does not need a human driver, it's a driverless car. So if you walk in this car, there's no steering wheel, no gas pedal, no brakes. You just get in, takes you anywhere you want to go, okay. And this is not a futuristic anymore, it's coming to a street near you. Okay, it's, it's actually going to arrive in London by law, 2015. It's already driving California, 2014 already. It's happening. So in a few years, you're going to have this thing. Okay, anywhere. Now, I want to invite you to think about this. To think about this. What kind of problems will automatically disappear after this? And what new problems might arise? What jobs will this will make obsolete, and what new jobs will this create as a car? I think uh, Tony mentioned about major technological changes. Tim talked about globalization. All of this have real effect in our real life. And those changes can challenge education. Now, let's imagine. What, what do you think? What comes to your mind? What, kind of, what won't be a problem in the future? My God, how smart. Okay. We are in a, in a wine center, right? Drink dry and driving will not be a problem. So we're going to send more jobs for winemakers. We're going to consume a lot more wine, right? You know, you can take, get off. You can start 6 o'clock in the morning, we can drink, you know. And uh, 9 o'clock, you know, we can drink, you know. Just, uh, you can drink anytime you want. No problem. Normally, actually, when I should, I started this um, thought experiment in Tasmania. Uh, there's not teachers with the Department of Education a few months ago. And most of me is men pop up the first, oh, drink driving will not be a problem. DUI will not be a problem. For females, most women say, I can do makeup now. <laughs> I can do makeup and driving. Okay. What other kind of things uh, may, may disappear? What other problems? Running into people. Running into people. Well, we tried that it's this morning. We, we were not successful running into people this morning, right? We'll stop, right? The car will stop, so we'll have fewer accidents, right? Is that, does that mean? What other things? What other things might change? Who? Hitchhikers and deep travel, right? They will not get it. Okay, that's a new one. Good. You were saying taxi drivers? There will be no taxi drivers. There will be no, no, no taxi drivers. And actually imagine something else like uh, it's going to free a lot of time for uh, parents who try to deliver the kids to all kinds of activities, right? You know, if you have a two-year-old wants to practice violin, just put in a car, go. <laughs> it's a, it's a, um, yeah, you, you will say, yeah, yeah why, why would you need that, right? Just, uh, or you want to send your baby to your grandma, you know, just put it in there, it goes. It's a, well, it won't be a problem, right? Yeah, and I'm sure this, uh, you know, in the, in the, that means, uh, the, the, and also means that uh, I was talking like, yesterday, um, the day before was in uh, Victoria. Someone said, well, your, your, your mother, you know, may visit you more often. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, what, what do you mean? I punch the scene, and the mother, you know, does not have to pick it up if he doesn't drive anymore, right? Just call the Google car. I mean, you know, elderly people, visually challenged people, all of those can drive. And then if uh, you don't arrest anyone for drunk driving, since we don't need uh, people to drive the car, there will be no need for driver's education, Right? If you don't need a driver's education, you don't need a department to issue those licenses or verification. Think about jobs, right? And if this car actually, uh, this car does regulates themselves, it does not rely on traffic lights. So we don't need traffic lights anymore. We just disappear, th those things, right? It's negotiating. And of course, then you think about uh, uh, all the jobs loss. I think we're going to lose a lot of uh, police jobs. At least, you know, people have, have nobody to arrest. You cannot arrest a drunk car, you know, but it's, uh, it's, uh, that's going to be hard, you know, where are you going to put it? But, uh, uh, but there's another big, big shift someone talk about. Maybe the idea of car ownership is going to disappear. Because it's so convenient, it can come at wherever you are, drop it off, 
find a place to park itself and have its own drinking without you knowing it. That's different. And uh, you don't know. You, not, if we don't need a car, if we don't own cars, what massive shift. Do you know when we buy cars, what we're buying? We're buying cars not rent as cars, as status symbols now, right? You already, I mean, so the car makers have been making cars to, as a property, as a status symbol for the last hundred some years. We've been shifting you know, different colors, different sizes, all those kind of things. Now, if this become public transportation, we don't care. You don't care what, how, what a bus looks like, you know. Typically, we don't. You know, that's why I was talking. It was in Melbourne. If you go to Melbourne, the trolleys look as ugly as they were 30 years ago. Nobody cared. You know, just get on, get you over there, and that may change insurance. So this cascading shifts. Of course, there are also new opportunities coming up. For example, how do you, uh, if you are good, how do you keep uh, the wine flowing in the car? Designing a bar. That's actually very interesting. To think about. And how are you going to help people spending their extra time with commuting? There might be more people actually since you can do this. You can get in a Google car. You don't want to fly. You want to drive to Melbourne now because you can sleep inside. You can do whatever you like. You know, it's a, it may change a lot of things. The reason I brought this Google car here is that in human society, we often run into some massive transform, uh, transformative technologies. And that may, uh, may adjust the value of knowledge, of talents. You know, we are all talented in different domains. We all have certain kind of knowledge. We all have some of those kind of things. And every school can teach something. And, but not everything is of equal economical value. That, that's all of value to the society. So what we do, we try to figure out what's valuable, what's not valuable. But technology does the redefinition every so often. For example, today we hold so dearly to our heart. We think uh, numeracy is absolutely essential for everybody. That wasn't the case 500 years ago. Do you notice 500 years ago? It wasn't the case. Until Gutenberg popularized you know, the, the printing press, everybody were forced to read. And uh, now everybody had to read. So illiteracy is a problem caused by Gutenberg. <laughs> Always blame him. He had nothing to do with you. Okay. And uh, actually, in my village, most people didn't read. Most people didn't. I, I mean, I, I was the very few who could read. Someone said, well, how, how did you get out of China? That, uh, I said, well, because you know, nobody was able to, to, to do anything, to teach me. I was useless in my village, so I had to leave. That's basically, I was able to read. That's the only thing I could do. I mean, in my village, they, if we had an Australian curriculum, if you treat my village as a nation, my village valued driving the water buffalo. So the NAPLAN would be NAPLAN water buffalo driving. That's not, nothing else. It's, uh, so it was, it was, I wasn't good, so I got to go, you know, go somewhere else. So, so remember, those technology redefines those things. The last time technology did a redefinition of human talent and knowledge, massive de redefinition was actually around 1850s, uh, 1860s. Uh, there was actually uh, an essay written by Herbert Spencer a British philosopher in 1869, I believe, called What Knowledge is of Most Worth? What Knowledge is of Most Worth? The, the conversation was this. In the, because at that time, you know, it was uh, human society was moving from rural farming to the city to industrial revolution. Most schools, if you were in a school, were teaching what? You know, teaching Latin and Greek. Latin and Greek would have been a the plan then. That, that's what's most important. Because, but they were useless stuff. The, the people were learning Latin Greek just simply to show they have money to learn useless stuff. You know how the rich people distinguish themselves from poor? They do useless things. <laughs> that, that's basically they do. Seriously, that, that's what they, So they have money to waste on useless stuff. That, that's how they go on. But then once you, you cannot force the practical people to do that. So Herbert Spencer said, is Latin and Greek absolutely worthwhile in a new age. Because Latin and Greek are good to dress up with a nobleman. So he said, they're, well, they're beautiful. They're like peacock's tail. You know, they look really beautiful, but useless. And he said, what we need in the industrial age is modern sciences. Physiology, physics, mathematics. So that's actually the beginning of the modern curriculum. That's very, so we did a massive, you know, change. 
ever since then, you know, our schools, we haven't done a lot of massive change. We are doing, we are adding a little bit, you know, we debate, we should add a language, make it global and competent, we add teaching, remember that while back, computer programming, you know, we add um, teaching Microsoft or Office, do you remember those times? We're teaching about logo, programming, we're, we're kind of playing, but the core has never been touched. We're still teaching the same thing. So are we doing the right thing? What's this whole thing changes? So that's the question to think about. How does technology, like the Google car, redefine the value of knowledge, talents, and skills? Should we stop and ask the question again, what knowledge is of most worth? We're doing this in Australia. ACARA has been playing with the Australian curriculum. And actually, even before it became ACARA, I was asked to talk to that group. Uh, by the way, I've been coming to Australia for a long, for a long time. I'm kind of, I'm kind of half Aussie now, you know, just, uh, uh, I found Australia to be the best place. You know, I was born in China. I went in America. I don't like either country. I think you have, you, Australia combines the best of both countries. So I'm here, okay. Be happy. And uh, now, when I know some of the Australian curriculum, it is in essence trying to make a good guess, a good bet to say, we want to ensure our children in Australia to be equipped with the proper knowledge and talents of the future. Now, what I want to ask you, is it a good bet? That's what you're debating. You have the curriculum review. You have a lot of people reviewing this thing. Are we having a good bet? Or are we having the wrong bet? So that's the kind of question to ask. You know, you, you, to this education, we always talk about our schools for, for 12 years, we want to prepare our children to be ready for college, to be ready for career. That's why something we'll talk about. You look Australia, to be successful living. That, that's the, the general idea. And I would agree. Uh, I, I, I think that's a very good goal, to be ready for college, to be ready for career. Because uh, I have a child, that's my daughter. I want her to be, I want her to be ready for something. Okay. Uh, for something. However, you, if you look at some of the economic analysis, some data, she's 16, by the way, and uh, I, I, I always wondered about this thing. I, I wrote yesterday, I think, at Advertiser, they think they published my op-ed uh, op piece about, uh, I was called to talk about ready for college or ready to move out of your parents' basement. And because I think the ultimate goal of education is independent living. You want to say that. Are our students equipped with the right skills and knowledge to be independent. Independent financially, independent socially, and independent psychologically. That, that's the key. Are we giving them the right skills and right talents or not? So here's some of the things that, um, which is sad to see right now. By the way, a lot of the slides you, uh, I use today is on my website. You can download them right now. It's a PDF format. If you want to follow me on Twitter or kind of can put me in a SASPA trading, that's, that'll be fine. Feel free to send my email, all this. Uh, so this is the, by the way, you can always find this. But I was going to show you this data, which I was really taken back by, is that college readiness does not mean out of your parents' basement readiness. That, that's the problem. In the US now, we got over 50% of university students are graduates on employed or underemployed. Australia, I just heard this one, like our youth unemployment in Australia just hit a 12-year high, a 12 in Australia. And China graduates 7 million college students a year. Many of them have no jobs in, in this case. And European countries, youth unemployment equally high. If you go to New Zealand, New Zealand, I think Australia has a better employment rate for youth. Actually, they come here and uh, you go to Canada, everybody's complaining the problem, youth unemployment. You know, youth unemployment is a really, really serious issue. If youth are not employed right after college, that, that's going to be really kind of persistent problem for a long time. In the UK, it's the same problem. Was in the, they're in, uh, in June, some, they are talking about the same kind of issue. So what is this, this issue? We have so many college students unemployed. And actually, in the, in the US, Australia too, we have another problem that's uh, uh, regarding youth is that they graduate with college, they borrow money to finish the college, 
and they have no job, or they're underemployed. Underemployed meaning they're employed part-time or not, not utilizing their skills. So for example, you have a college a chemistry major mopping the floor at, uh, I don't know, uh, some uh, coffee shop. So that's Today, I bet in Australia, yeah, I, I haven't taken a lot of taxi here, but in Melbourne, Sydney, you know, as you drive around, Australia can boast the best educated generation of bartenders and taxi drivers. You know, you can be very proud of that. It's, uh, uh, but, you know, it doesn't help. It uh, doesn't help much. They were not doing very well. So we have that problem. Now, another problem is that, so, socially speaking, we have this little paradox. We have so many people unemployed, highly educated, but then we have index. It's called, the, the, this is the index, by the way. Uh, it's, a, it's a global index of uh, talent shortage. So in 16 out of uh, 27 major uh, countries, we have a talent shortage problem. Actually, that includes uh, Australia and the US. For in the US, we got about 10 or 11 million jobs unfilled. In European countries, about two to four million jobs unfilled. Is that shocking? We are actually, Australia, if you go, some, some employers say, we don't have people. They say, we outsource our jobs because we don't have the qualified talents. China, the largest problem for multinational companies. In China, multinational companies is the lack of talents. I mean, you think about China, it's a god, you know, you got 1.3 billion people, 7 million college graduates each year, each year. And you can find people to work for you? That's true. We have a global talent shortage, a global talent shortage. So what we have here is that, on the one hand, we have lots of educated people. Remember, over the last 50 years, every country has been improving its education. Our children, you, know, you may complain everything. Our children today are better educated than any time in human history. That, that's just a fact. But at the same time, we don't have, we, and then they're un unemployed. And at the same time, we have people say, we need people. So that, what's the problem? This problem is, the problem is called a global talent mismatch. A global talent mismatch. Our children are not poorly educated. They are miseducated. They are miseducated. And now our education reform is ironically trying to make our children better educated and more miseducated. So we're trying to fix something. We're trying to fix our curriculum, fix our pedagogy, fix assessment. We continue to do the same thing. But without asking the question, are we really doing the right thing or are we simply doing the wrong thing more right? Maybe we're just doing that. You know, the Australian curriculum, the, the NAP plan. By the way, I'm not blaming Australia. Australia is just as uh, misinformed as Americans, as the Brits. So, so that, that, uh, the same, the politicians are just simply not well informed of what has happened, what has changed in this process. And uh, it's also been driven by OECD and the PISA group. Those people, I call the PISA group, Andrea Schleicher, the biggest and the most masterful illusionist. He has created this illusions of excellence, gave the PISA league tables as if that, you know, whoever scores higher are going to be the best in the future. So they put up Shanghai, they put up, you know, uh, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong. I can tell you they are not the best of the future. They might be the best of the past. All the reforms, I was, um, because I just did a research uh, project uh, in Singapore, Korea, and Hong Kong. We released on behalf of, of Victoria University. Actually, we're trying to release this uh, part of the report in two weeks in Melbourne. So I'll be back in Melbourne again in two weeks. And this uh, report I've tentatively titled called uh, Lessons from Asia That Matter. We've been le learning, I mean, like Grattan and other OECD, a lot of them are giving us the wrong lessons to learn, basically. They are make, they're trying to make our education, our meaning, Australia, US, others, as obsolete as the Asians. That's the idea. Well, without realizing, we needed a paradigm shift. So that's what, what really happened here. This is the kind of issue we need to really kind of think about. We used to have a different economy. We have a new economy. And in the old economy, this is the idea that we had a different education paradigm, a different education model. And the education model we had was like this. This is the existing model. This is the model we use today. So we think education 
is to equip our children with the skills, talents, knowledge that we believe will make them successful. And we call that the curriculum. You know, we prescribe in the curriculum. We bring a bunch of, you know, authorities. Most people are very old people, old, you know, because if you're not old, you can't be expert. If you're not expert, you cannot be on this panel. And so that's how, how we construct curriculum. And so we construct this curriculum. Then we make sure schools are doing a good job as leaders, as schools, to impose all that knowledge on our children. That's what we call implementing the curriculum. Then we verify that with standardized testing to make sure that you actually can acquire this at the right time. That's how we do it, right? That's all what you guys are doing. School leaders, you are basically here leading an institution to cram, to turn a lot of different materials into good sausages. So this is a sausage making model as well. And remember, the idea of a sausage is not bad, actually. Sausage is not bad, as long as you like it. So we're turning a lot of sausage. This is what I call the deficit model. You're going back to my beginning, my village. It's deficit model. The idea is that I prescribe something. Every student should know what I think you should know. And I, I don't care about what you know. Individual differences, you learn about multiple, you know, multiple intelligence has been there for about 30 years now, Howard Gardner and uh, all those uh, people have been talking about, we, uh, we are differently talented. We know we're differently talented, but we don't care about different talented. And we know we have cultural differences. People from different cultures, different strengths. And we know we have different learning styles. However, this model does not care. This model cares in so far as you learn what I want you to learn. So that's when students come to school, we assess you. Can you read? Can you write? So this actually amounts to the idea I, I talk about. It's, re, it's really like a discrimination. It's a discrimination against abilities. Because when you prescribe something, when you include something in the curriculum, you're excluding something else. Those students who happen to be interested and good at what you prescribed, or coming from families that have support for them to be good, what, they're good, what, what you prescribed, that's lemony, numerous literacy, we consider them as gifted, high achieving, and talented students. Those who may have other strengths, but not in the same areas as we want them to be, we put them in a special education group. This is actually, I've been writing about this, it's called talent discrimination. You know, in many Western societies, we have laws to protect, to, to fight against discrimination based on gender, based on race, based on sexual orientation, based on country of origin. But we never have forbid discrimination against different talents, multiple intelligences. You know, in our schools, actually, when we put government money in, when we talk about we favor math and literacy we actually, if we are not spending enough money to support people's development of artistic talents, don't you think that's discrimination? Well, that discrimination was necessary for the government for a long, t long time ago. Because with this model, for human society for a long time, we have not been able to truly enjoy the broad spectrum of human talents. We could not have, we have not done this. It also worked because we could predict what kind of jobs our students will have in the future. When societies did not change really fast, when we were isolated, you really can predict. Uh, I was visiting Geelong a few years ago. If you think about Geelong in the 1970s or 1960s, you could actually predict. When you graduate from high school, there is a Ford factory for you. You can go there to work there. It's not a problem. And you actually could describe. Another thing we could describe is that, because most of the people had similar skills, most people worked on jobs created by a few people. You know, millions of jobs were working on the same thing and created by a few people. By the way, if you notice the modern, modern society, those people who created the jobs did not come out of our schools. Some of the, the dropouts hired the graduates to run the jobs they have created. It's really interesting. So when you people, we need a lot of people have similar skills. We reduce them. We could predict. So this is the model, how it happens. 
That's why today we prescribe this subject, that subject, we send you to university, you finish all these things, this is called the, the just-in-case learning model. In the future, your job needs this thing, I'm teaching this, so if you meet my expectation, you'll become great. So we've been, we've been doing that all the way. In the sausage-making model, by the way, some systems are better at making sausage than others. You know, I would say like at Asian countries, Asian countries I know very well, uh, they're very good at making those sausages for uh, China. You know, if you look at the PISA score, basically the PISA measure measures how successful you are as a sausage maker. Seriously, that, but it measures homogenization, measures homogenization, measures how well you can homogenize people. Imagine if you can get 100% of people all learning the same thing, reduce the so-called diversity, you can force them to forget about everything else, you get better scores. In Finland, it's kind of homogenized, in many ways, homogenization. So that, this is the, how the traditional model works. Right now, the Western countries, US, UK, and others have been depressed because they're not as good a sausage maker as others. And but the sausage maker model has proven to be broken. It's not working anymore. Why? Because of the arrival of two things, I think both uh, Tony and the others and uh, Tim have mentioned about. It is the arrival of the flat world, globalization. Globalization has changed that. Globalization makes it impossible to isolate jobs makes it impossible to predict that in this village, we're going to have the jobs kept there forever. Globalization means people moving across borders. means jobs move across borders. Globalization basically means one thing, the death of distance. That is the, the time and effort it takes to cross distance has been dramatically reduced. In some cases, it does not even matter. In some cases, it doesn't matter. The transaction moving across this doesn't matter anymore. Therefore, you can have a, a job put into different segments and be done in different parts. So now that's why in the, in the uh, we began to offshoring jobs. In the 19, since 1970s, uh, textile, uh, uh, shoemaking, remember clothing, they were moved shift to Asia. And then following the 80s, electronic, uh, consumer electronics. I mean, Fans, you don't make electric fans anymore. Remember those things? And uh, refrigerators, uh, TVs, recorders, just move. They got, began to move to, uh, I think, first went to the Asian tigers. Remember those guys? The Thailand, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Then, in the at the end of 1980s, China began to open up. They shipped all to China. So, China becomes the world's factory. Now, China is losing those jobs to Vietnam. Vietnam is going to lose to Cambodia. Cambodia is going to Bangladesh. That's the whole idea. So, what's happening here? When distance doesn't matter, the cost of human talent matters. Human talent. So the first question for all of us to think about, are you teaching your children skills and knowledge and talents that cannot be cultivated in other places at less cost? Even if Australian students won, we talk about competition. I hate to the term of competition. It's not a competition, but opportunity created. Even if Australian students today scored as high on the PISA as students in Shanghai, Australian students in the future will not have a job. Why? You cost too much. Australia spends about average for 12 years $100,000 per student. U.S. is 115,000. China is probably 10,000 for all these 10 years in terms of money. So 10 times difference. So if you are teaching Australian students exactly the same skills, when skills is judged by both the quality and the cost, why would anyone use this talent when you get someone that's 10 times less? It's very simple logic, right? So, something. so that's, that's why we are losing, we have lost lots of, lots of, lots of jobs due to globalization. It's a very simple, simple thing, because those skills can be acquired cheaper. And those skills are not necessarily no skills. I'm not talking about shoemaking, I'm talking about computer programming. I'm talking about financing. I'm talking about accounting, because those jobs can be done overseas and they will be done overseas. That's the first big question, ask yourself, what can we do? Second major factor is we call the arrival of the second machine age.
the second machine age. The second machine age is in contrast to the first machine age. The first machine age was uh, driven by steam engine. Remember I talked about how those chips? Second machine age is the arrival of digital technology, computer chips. Computer chips, unlike steam engine, directly affects our cognitive functions or replaces our cognitive functions. Steam engine doesn't. Steam engine replaces our physical power. This one changes our cognitive power. And cognitive functions are an education business. Education is supposed to improve humans' cognitive functions. So how, ha how has technology affected us? Well, you may remember, some of you may remember this picture, <laughs> if you're old enough. Now we should look at this picture, right? This is quite stark, quite stark. The many people from our schools worked on factories like this. Now those jobs are gone. That's basically. So technology has replaced a lot, a lot of jobs. Google, is re Google cars replaced the driver. It's something very simple. You probably now checking online, remember, uh, with the airlines? That's causing jobs at Qantas. Okay, we're checking online. That's, we've, lot, we've made a lot of people lose jobs at bank, in, in the bank right now. And accountants, a lot of job, people lost jobs. Account, I mean, accountants lost jobs. Now, well, in America, actually, now we have now a surplus of lawyers. You know, in America, it's almost impossible to have a surplus of lawyers, but we do. And, uh, but we are still suing each other as much as possible. No worries. And, uh, and uh, the issue why we don't need as many lawyers. Law school are actually having a hard time. Why? Because simple. Now with databases, with search engines, we do not need so many legal workers who used to do actually go through case books and books to find cases, summarize them. Now it's the simple search engine. And then it's affecting much higher level of things. Um, think about um, health. With, uh, I, I studied this because agents always want to become doctors. I said, you know, that may not even work for you in the future. A typical doctor used to do, most of them do simple blood testing, you know, those heart monitoring, remember those things? 20 years ago, if you suspect that a heart problem, you go to hospital. They would monitor, check you. Today, they have a device on your iPhone, and the data transmits right away to the doctor. Many of the regular checks is apps. You know, that's really funny. It just changes the whole thing. And then even for higher level, uh, we're talking about heart specialists, cardiologists. If they are making suggestions, they monitor uh, the certain uh, operations. Traditionally, they have to be locally in the one hospital. Now with the telemedicine, they monitor multiple hospitals. They can do a lot, so you have to be great. So in essence, now we're facing the big challenge. We are, the challenge is that we, the loss of traditional middle class jobs. Tim was talking about the widening gap of income, which I completely agree there's a public policy problem, but the loss of the middle class has also to do with education. You see today in, in America since the 1970s, the middle income group is declining, the high income is growing, means percentage of high income, percentage of low income people are growing. So we have this bipolar growth bipolar growth in most developed countries. Why? Because traditional middle class jobs have lost either being outsourced or being replaced by machines and we have not found a way to regain that piece yet. This is not surprising. Education always runs a race between, you know, there is always a race between education and technology. This is a, a two Harvard economists wrote this book, talk about over the last 300 years how human beings have tried to deal with this race between technology and education. When I mention about Google Car, when I talk about changes, when technology redefines the value of talents, schools always respond much slower. We respond much slower. We don't even want to deal with that. So we, we have to catch up. We continue to teach the useless things. And in the hope that might be useful, we need to catch up to this race. To change this idea, it may take us 20, 30, 40 years, because the changes when we are seeing the arrival of globalization and the second machine age is still a very recent phenomenon. It's not really new. Remember this thing? Google this in probably 10 years. Do you guys have this thing? Ubiquitous access to, to information? 10 years. It hasn't happened. We haven't thought through about this issue yet. So now if you look at even a larger picture, 
Over the last 200 years, how have our jobs changed? Last 200 years. The green one indicates the percentage of jobs in farming, fishing, and forestry. Today, we produce more food. We don't need as many farmers. You know this very well. That's, uh, and we got about 2 or 3%. Even those farmers are not real traditional farmers anymore. They are more agricultural engineers, right? This, uh, because they're using more smart farming. They're using GPS to guide how things get plowed. They have apps to monitor each plant of the nitrogen level. It's really high-tech stuff. It's very interesting. And then those jobs get replaced by the blue line. We call them the working class. What are the working class? That's our traditional middle class. People who find a nine-to-five job, work on something, good compensation, good packages, our schools were producing those. The sausage-making model were producing the working class. I call that employment-oriented education. We help our children to find employment in other places. Since 1950s, actually more dramatic now from 1970s, this is called coincides with the globalization, version three, and the sophistication of computer chips. We began to lose those. Then you see the rise of two classes or two groups. One is called the creative class, one is the service class. The creative class are the high income group, the service class are the low income group. That, that's how it happens. The bartenders, the taxi drivers, all those things. The creative class are those who make things, who invent certain things. Creativity does not only mean art. They mean those guys who invent, like, say, the iPhone, the apps, and uh, invent useless stuff like uh, Facebook to waste your time. You know, all those kind of things. Is, uh, you know, uh, Zuckerberg is a really interesting story. You know, he himself is kind of socially challenged guy and invent something for you to socialize, but he doesn't really do it. It's really funny. And in, uh, uh, by the way, he makes a lot of money. Do you know how, how big Facebook is? You guys know face Facebook is shocking. Facebook is three times the size of General Motors. Money, in terms of market value. It's shocking, right? And so, so that we got all these things. So the rise of the creative class. Now my question to all of us, how do we recreate the middle class? Schools have not been responsible for the top class. We never produce them. I don't think you should claim uh, uh, responsibility for, made, uh, for producing Murdoch, uh, nor you should claim a responsibility for producing Steve Jobs, no. Those exceptionally creative people, if you let them be, they'll do whatever, ever. Uh, they will, basically, that's, you know, they'll be fine, okay? So what we want to do is recreate the middle class. Who is the new middle class? So the question number one, well, this gave us some hint, creativity. The creative class is the new middle class. That means everyone has to become creative, and creativity is the new job security. So, but schools have traditionally disliked creative people. Schools don't like, you know, the sausage making model, we don't like creative people. Do you, you not notice that? You know, like uh, children like this are generally considered not ready for school. School readiness, remember this one, right? We don't like kids like that, you're not ready. You are too radical, too different, you know, all, all those things. That's our truth, because they are, this kid is a nice piece of bacon, but not good sausage. <laughs> that, that, that's the problem, right? So, so schools have traditionally not have much to do with the creativity. Uh, if you go to Google Books, it's a really interesting function. If you want to do some risk called Engram, it basically tracks the frequency of any word that has appeared in the millions of Google Books. So I went in there, I typed in creativity, and this is what you see. Creativity was not mentioned in the millions of Google Books before 1920s. And then the number of mentionings jumped after 1980s. Why? That's before people began to realize we are not in the information economy anymore, we are in the creativity economy. Now people can make things. But, you know, we have been writing about children for a long time. There's a number of mentions about children versus creativity. So creativity is almost falls flat. We don't write about, about creativity. We write about children. And that's why, by the way, you go to most, most of you, when you were trained as teachers, as principals, you know that a lot of the books you read is about how do you manage kids, classroom management. Remember those kind of things? And it's about those things, but tell kids what not to do, 
how to lock them up. You know, that's how, how we would do those things. We don't write about creativity because creativity is disruptive. And, but now, suddenly we realize it's important. However, schools have traditionally already been a beautiful creativity killing machine. Most schools are designed to kill creativity, to stifle creativity. We want kids to learn certain rules and obey certain things. So this is the data from the US. This is not Australian data. I'm sure you, you don't do this. You allow kids to do whatever they like. And uh, this is the American data. Uh, the American data shows that when children come into our schools at age five, 98% of them are creative at the genius level. Everybody is creative at the genius level. Everybody. We are born with that, okay? After five years in our schools, we have 32% left at the same level. We got rid of 60 some percent. So, but that's not your problem. It's a primary school problem. Okay, I, I'll, I'll talk to them about this tomorrow. Okay, so you're fine. Okay, you, you, you're not that bad. Okay, but it's their problem. So, the, the, the biggest drop, decline, is around year three and year four. We call the fourth grade slump. In, that's a global phenomenon. Anywhere you observe, you know, it's fourth grade drop. And then after another five years in school, in your schools, and they come to middle school, secondary school, you only, you only care about like 20%. So you're not responsible for the entire problem, okay? And so when the age 15, 10% are left, and you look around, age 44, you finish university, you get a job, we got 2% left. That's all of us. So among us, if you have 2% creative people, we should be happy. That's why sometimes we say, oh my God, he is so creative. He's an out-of-the-box thinker. But if you talk to real creative people, they have no box to think about. I mean, if you think about a box, you're not creative. You're outside or inside, right? So that's a, and, and, but but the, there, is, there is hope. The data show that after retirement, your creativity has a chance to bounce back. Uh, as, as, evidence, as evidence, the American former president, George Bush, now is painting. I mean, if George can regain his creativity, you guys can do it. It's, uh, and they are, now, now they are, but they, like, what does actually this regain mean? It really suggests one important thing. Creativity is not only cognitive. You actually never lose it. You suppress it. You suppress. So in our schools, let's think about how we suppress our creativity. So I've used the term as creativity cannot be taught, but it can be killed. You actually can never truly kill it because it's, it can be misdirected, can be suppressed. So there are many different ways to suppress creativity. You know, I think uh, uh, Jim Davis, we, we, we have good, I have a good colleague called Ron Beghetto from University of Connecticut. He just wrote a book called uh, Killing Creativity Softly. A lot of our schools and teachers will kill creativity very softly. And do you remember like, Tim asking the question? This, that's a fantastic question. I don't know the answer, that's supporting creativity. But most often, our teachers say, well, we don't really have time for that. We got practice for NAPLAN. Remember, that's kind of creativity often. So you, you basically discourage questioning. You discourage curiosity. So now our job is to say, how do we regain creativity? How do we create a new environment for our students, to everyone to be creative? This is a very tall order. This is a very hard to do because we've been used to and our schools are judged, are evaluated based on how successful we kill creativity, not how successful we bring creativity back. So that's number one issue. So the new middle class is the creative class. But that's not sufficient. There's another le level of things. Remember when technology, when, the, when technology makes some jobs disappear, it recreates jobs. In this context, those people who invent robotics, robots, are rewarded. You know, when, when this uh, iPhone app takes jobs away from Qantas, it creates jobs for people writing apps. Do you notice that? You know, when globalization means jobs outsourced to other places, it creates new opportunities for translators, for immigration consultants, for travel and for a lot of tourist agents, and for global supply chain managers. It's very different, just different ways. We need to look at opportunities as educators. So, so what kind of ed new opportunities has new age created? That's another thing about. Well, basically, when technology 
makes some talents useless in one place, it makes some other talents more useful. Traditionally useless talents may have become more useful, and traditionally useless people may have become useful. For example, Kim Kardashian. You know Kim Kardashian? This is funny. Kardashian is a great story of how useless people can become useful. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm sure it, um, Kardashian is, in, how would she be useful? I mean, and she would have been completely useless, as useless as I was in my village, you know. People, nobody would pay to see her, you know. But I was actually doing some Googling last night. And Kim Kardashian is worth $40 million. $40 million. What does she do? Nothing. And, uh, and I, I use her as a, she's a really good example. This is something for us to ponder. It's something really serious. Uh, because there are some worse people than her. Like uh, there's another sh TV show in the U.S. called Here Comes Honey Boo Boo. That's it's even worse. It's just don't even think about it. But it's really bad. Uh, now, now, I saw Kim. I saw Kim. Some of you know the story. I saw Kim uh, uh, two years ago at ASPA conference. I think that's ASPA. Uh, yeah, with Andy Hargreaves. We were stepping in the elevator, and Kim was here. I didn't know who she was. And uh, someone said, "Please get out." Kim is here. So fine, get out. Okay, we're well, okay. And so then I walk out. It is in the Crown Metropolitan Hotel. That's a real story. You go there. You know Crown. And I don't know what the, she was doing there, but you know, and the, there's a lot of children, teenagers standing outside and waiting. I said, what are you guys doing? I said, we're waiting for Kim Kardashian for the autograph. And I said, oh, okay. I didn't know who she was. So I talked to my daughter. I showed her a picture. She, she is my pop culture consultant. I said, uh, so who is this Kim Kardashian person? She said, he's a celebrity. I said, a celebrity for what? My daughter said, nothing. <laughs> celebrity for Nothing. And the nothing is $40 million. So I said, I got to do some research about this. Okay, so I began to do some research in this one. I'm writing a new book, actually, it's precisely called The Kardashian Economy. It's really interesting. Uh, it's a reputation economy. We have truly arrived at a time that we consume nothing. You know, this is Daniel Pink calls this the age of abundance. There's many reasons for this, this nothingness, okay? Well, Kim Kardashian said, well, first of all, she, she, she doesn't, I don't know how many kind of college she went to, but she, she's not in her parents' basement, you know, to notice that? She's quite good. And so, age of abundance is the, versus the age of necessity. You know, for most of human societies today and most of human history, we lived in the age of necessity. That is, everything we do is about securing the necessary things for our survival, physiological survival. We need food, shelter, and clothing. Merely 100 years ago, Australians spent perhaps 80% of your energy securing those things. Today, we spend perhaps less than 40, 50%. Australians spend less than 50% on necessities. You spend the rest of the 50% on what? On Kim Kardashians. That, that, that's that's how, how we do it. So age of uh, abundance, what do we consume? We consume psychological and spiritual products. Entertainment, music, art, all those called psychological. And when, if it's psychological and spiritual, it's not homogeneous anymore. People consume different things. That's, look how many churches we have. You know, how, how many churches, non-churches, all those kind of things. So the first thing we consume, the largest commodity today we consume is called choice. It's called choice. You know how many different kind of choices in everything? I was born in the age of necessity and grew up in the age of necessity in China. I went to the U.S. in 1992. I was completely comp disabled in front of choices. I went to this uh, uh, shop to buy something to wash my hair and couldn't buy it because I did not know what kind of hair I had. <laughs> uh, you have to know. It's a... Uh, Normal, oily, dry, did you notice that? You know, that's a lot of knowledge. I had to go hire a hair consultant for this kind of work. <laughs> now I don't buy this stuff anymore. Did you notice that? It, it's, 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 uh, no. How many choices? I mean, in China I had a bar of soap for everything, for every piece of my skin, which was fine. You know? Do we need the choices? No, we just want the choices. The different brands of clothing, hairstyle, we like it. We love it. Age of abundance is about consuming useless stuff. It's like we use consume Latin and Greek.
all this stuff. Now let's expand that idea a little bit. Look at what we consume. In my village, we grow grass to feed the water buffalo. Was necessary. In most developed countries, the only reason we grow grass is to cut it. <laughs> right? We grow, we hire people, we trim it, we fertilize it, let's cut it for nothing. And then we find a pay people to take it away. I mean, it just, just doesn't make sense. You know, my father would think this is crazy. It's just, it's a, I mean, so that's how I did. I was, I grew up trying to go gather grass, bring home, fit water buffalo, get paid for. Now I get paid to take grass away for somebody else. To cut, it's just, now you go to a restaurant and they're there. I mean, you know this. It's that you go there, you don't go there for food. Because the more money you pay, the less food you get. <laughs> right? Why, why, why do you do that? Why, why do you do that? Age of abundance. We consume psychological, spiritual products. So whoever can create psychological and spiritual products wins. I mean, look at this, that iPhone. You look at that iPhone. How many different kind of covers do you have? Do you need a cover? You don't need a cover. You want a cover. Look at that. That's a beautiful cover, right? You got, you got it. And different style, different reasons. You create all these needs, psychological needs. So point is that we have arrived at a time the full spectrum of human talent can become valuable. But you have to create products, services, meet other people's needs. It's not finding jobs. It's always recreating something. Human beings are about recreating, about solving problems. Second reason Kim Kardashian has become useful, you have to agree with that, she has been useful enough, you know, okay, uh, is what we call globalization. She has some niche talent. Not everybody likes Kim Kardashian. Most people hate her. Most people, hate her. I just make fun of her, but most people hate her. And uh, you may have just one person of people like Kim Kardashian. Another one person goes to Lady Gaga, for example. That's the kind of things, right? It's mere one percent. Without globalization, any place you go, your circle, you can be consumed is very small. So like Kim Kardashian, I said, why is she useless in my village? My village used to have 200 people. If it's one person, it means two people will like her. Two people will not make her wealthy. So she would have just go steal like everybody else, plow rice. That's all she got to do. So that, that's the whole thing. And, uh, but today, with technology, with, with phones, internet, satellite television, their potential base is how many? Seven billion people, or five billion. So out of five billion, somebody's going to like you. I don't know if you've tried this. If you think you're crazy, if you get on the internet, someone's crazier than you. You can always find somebody. I don't know if you, you should run around this experiment. If you do anything on a website, someone's going to find you, email you. It's really strange. It's just, uh, it's, I don't know how. They, they just happen to find you. It's really interesting. So that means we call this the long tail phenomenon. The same thing is like in Adelaide or in some smaller villages, small towns nearby. If you have 5,000 people, your local bookstore cannot possibly carry a thousand titles. They have to carry maybe only 50 titles that has most popular titles. The same thing with the movie, movie theaters. I mean, in Adelaide, you cannot show the same kind of movies as in Melbourne because your base is so small. You have to see the mass appeal. But now Amazon can have many titles because Amazon can reach how many? Five billion, seven billion people. That's why it's valuable. This thing, so if it, okay, don't curse Kardashian. The same reason for soccer players. You know, FIFA is multi-billion dollar business. Soccer. You know, what kind of talents those guys have? Violent people, kicking each other, push each other. I mean, that's horrible people, those guys, the soccer players. It's a, what do they provide? Entertainment, the same thing, right? I mean, I never watched them. How do they deserve? Like David Beckham, you know, what, what does he do? Like, according to my father, he's useless. <laughs> he doesn't watch it. I'm actually, according to my father, I'm useless. In this, in the, I'm, <laughs> You, you make money by talking to people? He does never believe that. It's just, it's, so, but now think about this, this so-called talent. The same thing with Australian football. You know, the same thing. So those talents have become valuable because they can reach more people. They can reach a lot more people. So no matter how small a talent you have, if you think globally, that may change you. So that's my second point is that, first one, creativity. Number two, unique niche talent. We no longer have to homogenize people. Remember the curriculum? 
When we make a curriculum, we're labeling people. We're telling this is valuable according to this government. We're telling you this talent is worth cultivating, others not worth anything. Today, I think we have arrived at the time to believe if Kim Kardashian is useful, anyone can be useful. So that's our point. Now, my second point. School should be about expanding the talent to give everybody a chance to be great in their own. But that's not enough. We need another element in our education, which I call this element of the entrepreneur thinking. We have been teaching people, we have been teaching people to find jobs. But those jobs kept come and they kept disappearing. Today, like we were talking about, again, Tony, I want to appreciate what you talk about. You cannot predict what jobs will be there, what even professions will be there in 20, 30, 40 years. We know that's for sure. We, we know that, that that's there. For, the only profession that's secure is the one that you create for yourself. And today, a lot of the creative people don't create jobs. It's really sad, like Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, three times the size of General Motors, as I said, but they hire only about 5,000 people. You know, General Motors still hire about over 100,000 people. There's another company, WhatsApp. It's a little software company that sold for 1.6 or 1.7 billion dollars, had only 155 employees. If you were looking for a job, most likely you won't find it. You know, and then the jobs, that empty jobs, they're looking for somebody else. So this is what I call, we need to change our mindset. Creative, unique talent, and the entrepreneurial spirit. Entrepreneurs do not have to become, do not have to be only business entrepreneurs who are greedy people, maximize profit, exploiting other people. Entrepreneurs, as you heard from Tim, can be social entrepreneurs. You take entrepreneur approach to solve social problems. Entrepreneurs are also needed within an organization. These are the millions of jobs on field. They're not looking for employees. They're looking for intrapreneurs. People work from within a company. At Apple Computers, if you go to Apple, Apple's HR, Human Resource Department said, if you want to be managed, you are not employable. If you want to be managed, you are not employable. Very simple thing. I mean, if you go to Google, actually Google does very well. Google now has 14% of its employee without a college degree. Actually, they said, uh, they, they sometimes they direct, they, they don't never ask where you graduated from. They said, well, ask what you can do. A good student sometimes works against as entrepreneurs. Actually, they want to increase uh, their uh, uh, employees from without college degrees. Google's human resource department, they have a very strange way of finding people. They're not going to university campus to recruit. They are online. They scout the internet. They find who is interesting, who is doing cool stuff. No matter where you are, you may be a 13-year-old. They'll approach you. It's a very different way of thinking about this one. So intrapreneurs, those companies need intrapreneurs, people who work from within, who invent new things. And we also need policy entrepreneurs. This is what we call the traditional bureaucrats. You know, I was uh, talking to Richard Bolt from the Secretary of Education of Victoria. said, yeah, we, we, if policymakers are more entrepreneurial, they make better policies. This is very true. So from the public sector to the business sector to the social sector, we all need the entrepreneurial spirit. People who look at problems as opportunities. People who can raise questions. People who can decipher what do we need to do. People who are interested in using their own time and skill and talent to solve other people's problems at the same time providing opportunities for themselves. So that, that's how you do You spot opportunities. So what, what kind of things make us more entrepreneurial? That's what we call entrepreneurial qualities. It's a lot of debate, a lot of research now about entrepreneurship. To say, are entrepreneurs born or made? Interesting question. Are they born or made? Of course, as everything was a yes and yes. They're born and they're made. You know, the, some people are born with more or less, but education, so, social environments definitely can affect it. For example, some people are more confident than others. A born maybe like that, but you can definitely change that. I can make you more or less confident, and education plays a major role in that. Confidence is a very important defining quality of entrepreneurs, because entrepreneurs are always doing something new. If they are not confident, they will be convinced not to do it. 
So that, that's basically you have, by the way, as school leaders, I, I think you should be entrepreneurs and you are entrepreneurs. If you want to innovate, you have to have this confidence to do it. Confidence is not arrogance. Confidence is a very good assessment of what you can do. And you know, confidence also comes with resilience too. That you feel, you know how to feel, but you believe you can pick yourself up. A lot of times, when I talk about people, you know, when I went to school, I gained confidence. I can do this and also learn I'm not going to be confident in my farming skills. So confidence means you know what you're doing. By the way, there's a Timothy Judge is a labor uh, economist in the U.S. from University of Florida. University of Florida. He is, he, he just, his research shows confidence is one of the best predictors of your salary or income about 20 years after high school graduation. So it's very important to think about the confidence. And of course, friends, social capital. Do you know how to make friends? Are you socially you know, uh, capable? And are you able to, to take risk? And do you have a passion? Can you have creativity? All of these qualities come together. And again, there's, uh, most of them, we call them the non-cognitive qualities. You can add more. You can add growth mindset, resilience, great. In those terms, we are defining those terms. It's non-cognitive. Traditionally, non-cognitive uh, skills are valued only when they interfere with academic learning. Remember that says, you know, kids, oh, the kid's grade is dropping. He's depressed. Let's talk to him. Today, non-cognitive qualities of human beings have become valuable in their own right. They are important for entrepreneurial qualities. So this, we know these are very important, yet now we are countering in this one. I can assure you those skills cannot be cultivated in this, in this model. In fact, this model can hurt. So I want to bring you another idea before I move on to say what we actually can do. The idea of side effects. Because right now in many circles, the policy circles, they kept talking about fixing this model. We won't have a better curriculum. If we do not have an Australian curriculum, Australians will no longer be Australians. You never had the Australian curriculum, you're still Australians, you know. You remember the, this argument, um, Americans have the same argument. You know, if we did not have a, a common curriculum, how can we become Americans? They never had one. It's just really strange, but anyway, that, that's, so we think we, we should prescribe this. We're trying to fix this model, and I said, unless you can read, you can never do something else. Well, that's not necessarily true, it's, but we are trying to fix this model. We're trying to make sure everybody can do this, everybody can do that. There is a cost. People say, we don't have a cost. We, we can do this and this. We can have standards and creativity. We can have testing and diversity. Not really likely from a large set of data. This is called the side effects. You know, when you are in medicine, when you go buy Tylenol, if you read the warning label, there's a warning label. If you, you can cure your runny nose, but may cause a bleeding stomach. Have you noticed those things? Do you, I mean, you may not read it, but uh, it's there, okay? In education, have you received warning labels like this? That's a nap plan may do this, but may cause this. I know in the U.S., no child left behind, we know for sure, no child left behind has maybe, actually hasn't done this, uh, closed the achievement gap, but may cause a decline of creativity. In the U.S., actually we've seen a steady decline of creativity reported by Newsweek since 1990s after standard-driven education. There is side effects. As you know, some reading programs, I know early grades, I used to do early reading research, they should have warning label like this. This may improve your NAPLAN test scores, but may make your children hate reading forever. <laughs> do you have those things, right? You notice the, those ideas? And the side, of, side effects are fascinating to think about. So before I get on the side effects, I want to think about how side effects has resulted in several massive questions, big data questions. The big one, first one is called, why did not China have a big party? A big party to celebrate its outstanding PISA achievement. In Australia, we have your last government, Julia uh, Gillard. Do you still remember her? Okay, good. You know, people forget them very fast, okay. Uh, what? She went to high school here, that's why. Okay, good. She was education minister. They want to become top five on the PISA. They want Shanghai is dropping PISA. Shanghai is not going to participate in PISA. They're not interested in number one. They did not, uh, they did not 
celebrate this. Remember, Shanghai's PISA score and actually all the Asian countries' PISA score have shocked the West. Many people sung their praises. Like in America, for example, there was a book published called Surpassing Shanghai. That becomes America's national agenda. We want to beat Shanghai and test scores and all, all those kind of things. And uh, really made me almost regret I left China. I should have stayed in China be the default number one. But Arnie Duncan, Arnie Duncan is like uh, your Christopher Pine now, okay? Arnie Duncan, uh, by the way, Arnie Duncan played basketball in Australia. Uh, you did not teach him very well. He's ruining American education. He's a secretary of education in the U.S. He, uh, he said, the PISA scores is a wake-up call for America, you know, for education. A wake-up call. You know, Arnie has had many wake-up calls, but uh, I don't think he, he is waking up yet. But uh, it's, uh, the trouble is, politicians always use the term, that's a wake-up call. But I'm still going to put a snooze button. I'm going to sleep more. That's, a, that's the thing, problem with. And then uh, Obama says a Sputnik moment. And in Australia, do you remember a few years ago, you had this two, two years ago, Grattan Institute out of Melbourne produced a report called Catching Up, Learning from Asian Countries. And they said, uh, and a lot of news caught this to say, Australian children are two years behind Asians, Shanghai students, in math. That sounds really scary, okay, that's very scary. So the China should have celebrated him. And there's another uh, guy in the, in the US called um, Ed Randell, who is governor of Pennsylvania, a huge state you know, in the US, Pennsylvania, near New York. And he, was, uh, he used to run a radio show, and uh, Philadelphia, had, just that year, they had to cancel a football game. You know, like Australian football, people get really mad. He was really angry, he was the governor. And you think football had nothing to do with China, right? I mean, but China just had good test scores. But now, of course, the governor put China into the story, and this is what he said. He went on radio. He cursed the whole state. He said, now, nah, we've become a nation of usis. The Chinese are kicking our butt in everything. If this was in China, do you think the Chinese would have caught off the game? People would have been marching down to the stadium. They would have been, they would have walked, and they would have been doing calculus on their way down. That's, a, <laughs> that's how, how powerful the pizza was. So it impressed a lot of people. And if you go to uh, uh, England, uh, Michael Gove, you know Michael Gove, uh, who is the Secretary of Education there, and uh, we're getting some of the worst Secretaries of Education around the world. And this is what he went to China, went to Singapore, he went back to England, wrote in this one, in the, in the Independence as op-ed, he said, I'm happy to confess, I'd like us to implement a cultural revolution just like the one they've had in China. He had no idea what the cultural revolution was. He needs an education. He said, I like Chairman Mao. We've embarked on long march to reform our education system. Did we just condemn Mao as a dicta dic dictator? Did we just say, now want Chairman Mao? It's a really interesting idea. But the Chinese said, no, we don't have a good education. We have good test scores. We don't have good education. It's nothing to celebrate. They never celebrated. Why? Because they said, we need Steve Jobs. Now, there's a lot of people who say, well, you can't have Steve in China. Uh, this is an interesting question. When Steve Jobs died, there was a national debate in China that said, what happened to the Chinese Steve Jobs? Theoretically, China would have four times of baby Steve Jobs born, right? Because we have four times the population of the U.S. What happened to that Steve Jobs? That job, Steve Jobs was killed by the education system test scores. That Steve Jobs was going to be a piece of bacon, but was made into sausage, into poor sausage. That's all what happened. You know? So that's why in China, they talk about the patents. China has... Uh, 20% of the world's population, 9% of the GDP, but only 1% of the world's patents. By the way, the same thing has been said about Singapore. Steve Wozniak, the Apple co-founder, said that the Apple computer or Steve Jobs can never exist in Singapore because uh, Singapore does not allow poor behaviors. And Jobs had a lot of bad behaviors, Steve Jobs, in this one. This is, so this is the interesting question to pose. Number one question. Number two, big question. Why aren't the model minority happy? The model minority means Vietnamese, Chinese, all those. You know, in the Australia, these kids, uh, uh, a lot of Asian kids, they do very well. By the way, a recent study says there's nothing wrong with Australian edge schools because Chinese, and Chinese students in Australian schools, their PISA scores are as high as students in Shanghai. So it's a culture factor. It's not a school factor. So it's really, that's just some news reason. The same thing happened in New Zealand. They analyzed two countries' data. Chinese students in New Zealand, they score as high 
Estrons in Shanghai. So this is very interesting data. Okay. So anyway, the agents, they're called the model minorities. They always outscore every other, other group, test scores. And you know, this is test scores in the US. I'm sure you have the same thing. So if you go to Eastern Melbourne, by the way, if you want to fix your NAPLAN scores, import a few Chinese kids. <laughs> I, I much, much faster, easier to fix than trying to teach it. You know, yes, uh, and uh, they, uh, it's called globalization can help. Okay, and now the Asian kids. If you look at U.S. data, about Asians, about five percent of the U.S. population, they are 15 to 25 percent of Ivy League, the most prestigious university enrollment and 24% at Stanford University, 46 at UC Berkeley. Uh, you know there's a university called University of Los Angeles? Do you guys have heard about this one? It's a very good university, which is short for UCLA. And that's what they use, it has a lot of agents. They say UCLA stands for UC lots of agents. That's what they call this one, UC Los Angeles. But a huge piece of data came out recently said, how come Asians have not taken leadership positions? They want to be leaders, so they have all done this outstanding academic achievement, but yet they are not achieving something else. What happened to them? That's another thing called side effect. What did they lose along the way? That's the, then we have another big issue called um, why is America still here? You, should, you can ask the same question about Australia. Why are we still here? Because you, today, you know, you read a lot of stories. People always kind of have historical problems. They don't remember us. So Oh, our education is in decline. Our education is getting worse. Every time when PISA releases, Tim's or you say the same thing in, in Sydney morning here, the Australia, and ever says our education decline. The same thing happens in America. I can tell you, in Australia and in America, historical data suggests that education in these countries have not been declining. It's not in decline. It's not getting worse. It has always been bad. It's been bad for a long time, really. If you look at historical data, I won't show you the American data. 1960s, 1964, 1964, American students took part in the first international mathematics study. Americans 12th graders, means graduate year, finished last. I think Australia was the second to last. You were not any better than Americans, okay. So if you look at this, they've never been good, never been good. And, but America is still here. This is the, but U, UK has never been good either. I'm just looking at UK. I, have, I don't have a slide for Australia. I can track this data down for you if you want to. You've never been good. Don't worry about it. There's no good old days. Okay. And so, never been good. But America is not only still here, America is doing fine. You see, America still has the largest economy, according to Obama. And this is actually true. This is factual. It's more factual than some of other Obama's facts, you know, Obama other facts. It's more factual than his other facts. But it's true. How did that happen? So that's why I want to go back to the idea of side effects. What truly happened? When you gain this, what did you lose? And we're talking about confidence, entrepreneur skills, those non-cognitive qualities. So there's one of the explanations to talk about. That is uh, the idea of confidence. You know, test score-wise, American students have always scored below Asian countries. In 2003, trends in international mathematics study teams had the same pattern. But on all international tests, they always have non-cognitive questions, which are seldom reported. It's about confidence. Are the kids confident? PISA has the same kind of scores. So as you might predict, Americans, they are ignorant, but they are confident. You know. <laughs> So they, they outconfident everybody. They, are, they think they're better than everybody. It's a, and this is the, how, how it works with, with this kind of things. So here we, we have the, uh, the idea. It's, uh, uh, th th this phenomena, by the way, this is not a one country phenomena. And it is actually a global phenomenon. Out of the 42 countries participated in, in, on TIMS in 2003, there is a strong, significant negative correlation between scores and confidence. Countries with high scores have lower confidence in fourth and eighth grade and less enjoyment, which is really interesting, right? That's, and this is not a one-time deal. This is a longitudinal deal. Look at uh, the uh, 2011, Tim's reported, but they want to show you how, how Australians 
your scores, look at you. You're even worse than American students, test scores, math-wise, you know. Eh, but you're not bad in confidence. If you look at Korea, Korea is 100 points higher, eighth grade. You got about 3% in, in think they're good. And at Australia, you at least have 17%, you know, not high. And do you value math? You know, again, Australians, according to this test, you may not know about m much about math, but you think math is important. Generally, 46%. But in Korea, they know a lot, but only 14%. And this is not only one test. It's across tests. This is TIMS. And you look at PISA. I was just going to show you one piece of that. In Finland, we think Finland has great science scores, students in science. But Finnish students have very in little interest in science. They're the lowest of all OECD countries. So Finnish government are worried that uh, their children have no interest in science. It's a national security problem. Because if you have no interest in science, you're not going to pursue science. Science scientific test scores shows nothing about your ability to do science. Actually, only basically shows tests. And on PISA has exactly the same problem. All negative correlations between test scores and non-cognitive factors. And which corresponds then to the, the uh, entrepreneurship. I took the entrepreneurship data called Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Data and tried to, co tried to correlate with the PISA data. The red bars are the PISA math scores, and the blue bars are the entrepreneur talents. If you read from number one, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, Finland, and he said entrepreneurship, they don't go together. So entrepreneurship has an all negative correlation backwards. So what does this really mean? Side effect. This explains basically how, you know, despite all your poor performances, the country is still here. It's something else happened. In between, you preserved something else. This means why the Asian students, they may be so well, but they lack the social ability, the emotional, the risk taken, the imagination, the confidence. This explains why in Asian countries, they are trying to reform their education all the time. This is why they did not say it. They want something else. And this also explained from, again, a global speaking, Keith Baker did a really interesting study he said, I'm, people always think, st in, you know, scores matter. He said, I'm going to take a look. Again, I'm going back to 1964, this data. First international mathematics study said, about 12 countries participated. Keith Baker, scientist from the U.S. Department of Education, he said, if they mattered, remember 1964, those students, if we study today, would have almost approaching retirement. Okay, they were uh, eighth grade. So they've been working in those industries. What did they do? If they were, if the scores meant something, that would show up in their economy. That's the whole idea. So he said, okay, I'm going to take a look. 40 years after test scores, let's look at a measure, what measures us matters in a society. Let's look at liberty, happiness, you know, life. We we'll think about those are important in, in a society. So he says, now let's take a look. 40 years later after the first test, basically says that the higher our nation's test scores 40 years ago, the worse its economical performance on wealth, on national wealth, I means GDP. Those countries scored higher, didn't do well on 40 years later. Growth, the rate of economical growth for nations improved as test scores dropped. Growth. There's no relationship between FIMS and hourly output. First, international mathematics test scores. The negative, there's a negative correlation between quality of life and test scores. By the way, to get high test scores, I can tell you, if you're stuck in a math camp, that's not a happy place. The quality of life is not high, okay. And democracy, democracy is the same thing. Countries with high scores are worse places to, to have democracy. It's very true, actually. I, in my new book, I talk about, a lot about the new data. Countries with the, Authoritarian countries, authoritarian culture, children have a lot higher self condemnation on the PISA. They always blame themselves. Democratic countries, kids began to blame their teachers. And Andrea Schleicher think blaming yourself is better. I said, no, actually, self condemnation is not good. You always should blame somebody else, you know. Like, uh, no. And livability, six of the nine countries that scored higher than FIMS than the US are worse places to live. So all of this data can go to creativity. And all of this basically shows have no correlation. This is the past. Remember, this is the past. Even the sausage-making model, 
We have good sausage making model, we have bad sausage making model. American education, Australian education in the past, you were a broken sausage maker that made some bacon. <laughs> and now we try to fix it. We try to make it a really good, a really, really opposite sausage maker so we can worse when we need a different paradigm. Australia education reform and America reform are destroying their traditional strength. We're trying to fix the past without inventing the future. So that's why I'm bringing back the Google car. When we have faced a new economy, we should ask new questions. So when new technology comes in, old problems might disappear. The equity problem, for example, achievement gap. If you measure in a different way, the achievement gap may not be there. Maybe in the children from poor families, from Aboriginal places, if you look at what they can do first, maybe they'll become better. Maybe they don't need to be fixed. They need to be supported. So I'm thinking about the problem before Google car, 1870s or 1890s, I forgot. There was a huge global conference in Paris trying to solve a huge problem, horse manures. You know, uh, there are too many horses. We use horses driving in, in uh, Sydney and Melbourne. The issue was that, globally speaking, if we did not solve the horse manure problem, Sydney, Melbourne, New York would be, would be buried under five miles of horse manure by the 1950s. We never solved that problem. Sydney is fine. What happened? New technology. Combust combustion engine came along. That problem did not have to be solved. Today, do we have to rethink about the problem? How do we address this? So how do we cultivate the entrepreneurial, the creative, and individual talents? So I'm calling for a big shift of paradigm. And this is a new paradigm of education. The new paradigm is not about fixing children's deficit, but enhance their strength. It's about following their passions, but make every child grow in their own way. They grow better in their own way. They do not grow according to somebody else. And this is true greatness that comes in. Our schools, we spend so much money in the developed countries. Only we, maybe a few of us, developed countries, have the resource to actually make it happen. We have a lot more resources. We have, uh, you have violins, you have musical instruments, you have sports facilities, you have museums, you have art galleries. Most countries have no access to that. When you have no access, you cannot cultivate a diversity of talents. You have the force to be. Uh, I had uh, always thought I could have become a better Justin Bieber, but didn't become one because I had no access to music. You cannot access those things. And imagine your schools, uh, you, you, cannot do, you cannot have a lot, you cannot have kids in schools like this. This was a school in Tanzania, I was there. It's a school. You cannot have a personalization school in this one. Kids in this school, it will be hard for them to imagine inventing the iPhone. Right, it's, we are squandering of opportunities when we can do a lot more. We are trying to become the best of the past, not to invent the future. So I challenge you to think about the future. The future school is one that enhances every talent. That has the three elements. Instead of imposing our children a national curriculum, an externally prescribed curriculum, enable them to have a personalized curriculum. Can every child have an emerging curriculum that supports his or her passion and interest? No matter where they come from, they are immigrants, poor families, aboriginals, wherever they are. Look hard enough, every child has strength. And we do not do value judgment to say, this is strength we like, this is strength we don't like. We should do that anyway, philosophically, but today I hope I presented in even enough economical reason for you to do that. It's a necessity to value diversity. A society, if you don't have a diversity of talents, you die. That's the basic thing that called genetic diversity. We have to celebrate diversity even for economic reasons, not only for humanity reasons. So the first number one, can we have a curriculum that's personalized? Can we follow them? Can we not judge them in the beginning? Student-driven learning, it's possible. So I was talking at uh, the PAI yesterday, uh, talk about can we treat our schools as museums of learning opportunities? 
you curate great opportunities, but you never impose upon everybody. Number two, with technology like this, technology enables schools, changes schools. It should also redefine the value of teachers, too, educators. I'm so happy that, Jan, you have this great title, the ungoogleable. Now, if a student can Google everything, why do we need a teacher? The teacher needs to do the ungoogleable things. And the teacher becomes a reason. So I'm, suppo I'm proposing a different pedagogy. The, from the what to the how, the different pedagogy shall become product-oriented learning that allows our children to practice being a creator, to exercise their talent, to learn to become excellent entrepreneur by making products from very early on. I know a lot of schools do this. I, I think uh, uh, the, a lot of schools are already doing this. I get a lot of email from people. You want to choose a good entrepreneur can identify needs. A good entrepreneur is one who uses his time, efforts, and talents to help others. They want, we want them to solve problems. A good entrepreneur has to become great. Creativity, different talents of no value if they are not great. But in schools, we tolerate being operated. Today's education, when we talk about rigor, this is very big rigor. It's extra rigor so that's nothing to do with internal rigor. All this stuff. Our work today to get a perfect score on any test, that's not great. That's mediocre, that's good enough. Because you're beating other people's expectations. Test scores only measure your ability to take tests, nothing else. Nothing else. Now we want greatness. Let me show you an example of greatness. Some of you have seen this. It's not the best, but pretty good example. It's called Austin Butterfly. Austin is a seven year old, year one student. Year one, this is from Ron Berger from Harvard's project. And Austin was asked to draw a scientific portrait of a butterfly. And Austin has this butterfly to show. That's a very good butterfly for a year one student. I can assure you, you don't see many butterflies like that year one. I have kids, my, I'm, I'm, they never brought home those butterflies. I can, you know, in my shoe boxes, on my refrigerator, I have a lot of these butterflies. Bad uh, butterflies. But that's uh, most of our children produce. Do you notice that? You, we, we engage our children to make posters, to write essays, to sing. Most of them end up as bad as that. That's of no value. That's mediocre. You can give an A to the student. That's useless. We do, but we tolerate those things. You know, in, right now, by the way, when we have technology, we have kids to make videos, sing something. We're happy as long as they do it. But you know that's crap. It's really bad, I've seen a lot of bad things. That video today you showed, that was excellent. That's high quality, professional. We want our students to move from that butterfly to this butterfly. And Austin did it because he created it. Austin went through multiple drafts. Austin had a purpose. Austin had friends to tell him, give him feedback to say, Austin, do you think the butterfly is that round and that small? And Austin said, no, let me go back, recreate. You cannot teach him to recreate like that. It has nothing to copy. He invented it. And then he revised it, third draft. Then he revised again, third and fourth. That's how we get there. That's how, when we, our child writes essay, writes songs, do solving math problems, building the scientific exhibits, our schools all engaged in demand excellence, demand greatness. That's the only way to develop that is through authentic product making. I call product-oriented learning. And all of this should happen where in a globalized context. To this technology, globalization has become reality. Our school has no reason to limit our children's learning opportunities to what we can offer with a confinement of four walls. I was uh, talking to Victoria, Department of Education, as too often, they ask me, how do we get opportunity to get more people to do this? I'm, when I said I might offend you, but I'm leaving anyways, forget how you are. I said, we have to make sure we can create the opportunities that students can access without the interference of adults. I don't even know. Sometimes a principal is too busy. A principal is too preoccupied. And he said, I cannot take advantage of that opportunity. You, you in essence, filter that opportunity out. Do you see what I mean? So we should change that thinking. 
Our children should not suffer just because adults are too busy solving their own problems. We should open our learning campus, globalized campus. And also our children should learn to learn for each other. When our children are making projects, products like this, they should serve other purposes. I just got an email from Hong, a, Hong, a school in Hong Kong, and they are having students actually uh, writing um, books. Actually, it's a school in Beijing, too. Uh, another school in Prague. The students are learning Mandarin. They are writing Chinese stories for younger students with voices. That's authentic products globally. Australian students can do exactly the same to help creating products for others and vice versa. Your students can be writing, I don't know, English novels, English writings for students in China who are learning Chinese for Indonesia. So all of those things can happen. So I want to encourage you to think about the whole process, about what can we do to give students more autonomy, to engage students in doing more of authentic learning, and let students drive the process and make sure they become global citizens. All of this. I will not have time to tell you what exactly to do, but I have some suggestions, as you can see that. You can download the slides, remember this? So if you want to truly make this happen, we are running some experiments right now. And uh, I think Jim knows this. I was, I was talking about Oba World. It's an online learning platform I have organized in the University of Oregon. We want to allow every school, every student, every teacher to create products for each other, to personalize learning. Because as you know, in school, you cannot offer a course for everybody. Let students create courses for each other. Their students create opportunities for each other. You can explore this by yourself. It's online. It's an online learning management system. It's an online community. It's a teaching. It's hosted in the cloud. You don't have to own it. It's a space anywhere. You sign on. You do it. The first version is closed for young children. The second version is completely open. Anyone can sign on, and it's free. The first version is not free, but it's almost free. You don't have to pay anything. You just have the system. You can use to online distance teaching. Your students, could you can actually create a South Australian virtual school, enroll your students to teach students from other countries. You can do the same thing. You, any one of a school can become a host of a language. For You can become the Mandarin school. You can offer, your students can offer courses to Victoria or Queensland. You can do the same thing. We should take advantage of this. So to end, keep our children out of our basement. Remember we said that then? We need our children to be confident, to be curious, to be creative, to be great. And to do all of this, it's actually one simple solution. Just read my book. <laughs> OK, this is a, it's a food commercial. Oh, if you really don't want to read my book, you can always go here and find, a, find my, on my website. So principals are very, at a very interesting time right now. School leaders are at a very interesting time. Are we able to lead the paradigm change, or are we trying to fix the old paradigm? But I can say from history, fixing the horse wagon will not get us to the moon, no matter how fat the horses can be. We have to move. Co I mean, Nokia, nobody uses Nokia phone anymore, right? Nokia died because Nokia killed Nokia. Nokia wants to make this dumb phone smart. They're not making their smartphones smarter. Nokia was trying to perfect an old paradigm, even though it invented App Store like this. It capitalized on its past success of making dumb phones. Today, time for the paradigm shift. Build a new kind of education that liberates human talents, not stifles it. Thank you.